It's another beautiful day for baseball in Los Angeles. And baseball podcast. Josh Schaefer and Blake Harris cover everything Dodgers right here on Inside the Ravine. How is it going, everyone? Welcome to a brand new episode of Inside the Ravine. Joining me, as always, my co-host, Josh Schaefer. I'm your host, Blake Harris. Josh, it's been a couple of weeks since we recorded our last episode, and probably on any normal circumstance, if we go three weeks without recording an episode during the offseason, this episode would probably be two to three hours, because there would be so much news to talk about. But we took a little break, took a couple of weeks off, and there's about there's pretty much about as much to talk about than there was in early November. So, unfortunately, not a long episode, but I guess we do have some things to kind of discuss. But, hey, it's, it's not a hot stove, Josh. It's a, a freezing, ice-cold stove right now. Yeah, I'm hoping that our show, maybe next week, we have a lot to talk about. But... As of right now, not a whole lot to talk about. Um, Dodgers made a couple of signings um, these these last couple of weeks. Nothing too crazy, and a couple of things that we also considered would we, we considered would be likely, um, and and they both happen. And happy with both of them. We're going to dive into those in a little bit, but still, I think not just Dodgers fans um, and and the two of us have have not just been waiting for this news. It's been a little bit of everybody waiting for some news about Shohei Otani. And let's just step away from Shohei for a second, but also a lot of the other big free agents, I think people have been waiting for some sort of of information to come out. And really, we haven't got a whole lot. I mean, the biggest move so far was a couple of days ago, the Mariners and completing a little bit of a deal. Like, But really, like right now, I feel like there's not a lot going on for the Dodgers, but we're hoping that within the next couple of days, maybe even in a week or so, we'll have some some hopefully big news to talk about, and we got a little bit of that today. Yeah, right now in Nashville, every MLB GM, executive, manager, a lot of players, a lot of agents, every beat reporter out there, they're all in Nashville for the winter meetings, and there's nothing going on because nothing is going to happen until a certain someone decides to sign. So we are going to be talking about that before we get into the latest with Shohei Otani. Make sure you guys listen to the show on whatever podcast app you guys use we're on spotify we're on apple we're on the odyssey app we're also on youtube where you can see josh and i currently and this was not planned wearing ugly christmas sweater t-shirts both different ones those are fantastic again that just goes to show how we are as co-hosts we're just so on top of it josh we don't even have to prepare for this we just know how to come we know how to dress so that just goes to show the chemistry there you guys can also find this show on whatever social media app you guys use twitter slash x Instagram, TikTok, and again, YouTube at Inside the Ravine. Find us there. But Josh, let's get to it because as of what, December 5th, 1240 p.m. on the West Coast, Shohei Otani is still a free agent. Uh, There were a lot of reports once the offseason started that Shohei would actually sign before the winter meetings, but now it's kind of dragging along and no one knows when he's going to sign. There are reports that he could sign within the next week. I saw some tweet yesterday saying, what if Shohei signs in March? And that would be the ultimate just <laughs> stab right to the chest if we have to wait this out until March. But people think he's going to sign relatively soon. He's reportedly meeting with a bunch of teams. Now, Josh, it's a good thing we recorded this now because had we recorded an hour ago, we wouldn't be able to talk about this piece of news because as of about 15 minutes ago, I guess Dave Roberts was speaking with the media and he pretty much said, yeah, we met with Shohei Otani. Literally right before you hopped on, I saw the clip of the interview and he was asked about whether or not they had met with him and Dave pretty much says uh yeah I think that's a possibility I think we're gonna meet with him and then he had like a five second pause and then he just goes yeah I'm gonna be straight with you yeah we did meet with him because I think he realized it's gonna come out some way and if you remember I think it was Jeff Passan reported this about a week ago I guess Shohei or Shohei's camp pretty much said if there are any leaks about any meetings with any teams Shohei is going to hold that against those teams. Now, yesterday, Ken Rosenthal posted an article saying that the Blue Jays met with Shohei on Monday, and everyone, myself included, were dunking on the Blue Jays because, hey, that's going to go against them. Fast forward 12 hours later, 
the Dodgers met with Shohei, and everyone's dunking on the Dodgers. But I will say, Josh, before I throw it to you, I don't think this is necessarily a leak when it's coming from the manager of your team. I think Dave Roberts is a smart enough man where he probably got the green light from Andrew Friedman, Brandon Gomes, and they said, hey, if you're asked about it, by all means, you can talk about it. So I'm not stressing too much that uh, Dave Roberts spilled the beans that they met with Shohei, but I think it's funny seeing all of Twitter right now currently uh, burning down. It's like that that meme of SpongeBob when they're all like running around that big office trying to burn everything. That's exactly what I'm thinking of right now on Twitter. Yeah, pretty much, Blake. Look, I... I don't think Shohei's really going to hold this against teams. I think it's kind of a blanket. Like, we don't want anything to leak, which I understand. But let's be honest for a second here. Like, Dave's saying, yeah, we met with Shohei. It's not like a big surprise <laughs> or anything. They, were the, they, right. they had the highest odds. They had the high, We all knew this. We could have never heard about it. If you would have asked me in two weeks if Dave had never said anything, regardless of whether or not Shohei had signed, if you were like, hey, do you think the Dodgers met with him? A billion percent with a B, a billion percent. Yes. Like we knew this, we knew he was going to meet with the Dodgers. Like, Oh, oh, like the Padres are interested in Shohei. Really? I wonder why. Like, I look, I, I don't, this, I feel like changes absolutely nothing. I do think you're right. I feel like Dave's a smart guy. I wouldn't even consider this a leak. I think this is him just telling everybody what it is. And that's that the Dodgers met with Shohei Otani. So I'm not super concerned about a leak or anything and it being held against the Dodgers or anything like that. Um, And also, I I think that Dave wouldn't say anything unless he felt like it was okay. Um, Beyond that, like I said, like it's this isn't a surprise. We knew that this was going to happen. We obviously don't know where he's going to sign. I I feel like nobody really has any idea of where he's really going to sign. And then there's teams with higher odds than others, but realistically, like everybody's interested. We know that. And we know that all of the, all of the top dogs, all of the high spenders are going to be in on Shohei Otani and they're going to meet with him because they have the the funds to do so and the means to do so. So it it really changes nothing for me. I hope um, deep down that maybe Dave is saying something because he knows something, but in reality, the Dodgers met with Shohei Otani at Dodger stadium, according to Dave Roberts, we knew this was going to happen anyway. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not groundbreaking news by any means. And the thing, of course, everyone's saying, if, so, if, if Shohei somehow signs somewhere else, everyone is going to be blaming Dave Roberts once again. As if he needed more things to be blamed for, everyone's going to be blaming Dave if that's the case. But I agree, Josh, because if you're Shohei Otani, I do agree, like, he will hold it against teams, you know, if they, if they leak that. Because you know what, that kind of stuff leaked. But the Ken Rosenthal article is different than what Dave said, because again, this is from the manager saying, yeah, we met with him. Ken Rosenthal is the one dropping the article saying, hey, by the way, this went down. So if you're Shohei, I mean, again, he's probably had an idea for a while where he wants to go. Obviously, you're going to meet with every team, just hear what their pitches. But let's just say Shohei Otani has kind of always been set on the Dodgers. They made him a strong offer. They gave him all the different reasons why playing for the Dodgers would be a great move. I don't think Shohei's going to say, hold up, wait a second. Dave Roberts said we had a meeting. Scratch that. No, I I don't want that anymore. I'm going to plan B. Like, that's not going to be the case. He might be, you know, slightly upset, but I I still don't think that's going to be the case at this point. So I'm not too concerned about it, but it is going to be interesting, Josh, because again, with the whole Shohei thing, every team is kind of scared to make a move until the Shohei domino falls. Now, I kind of get it to an extent. I mean, if you just assume the Dodgers are going to sign him, I don't know why teams can't potentially make other trades, make other signings, but we're probably not going to be getting anything until Shohei signs. And again, hopefully, for everyone's sake, it's within the next week. Because the tough part for the Dodgers is as well, they have a a lot of other needs they need to address this offseason. And they can't really do that until Shohei signs or doesn't sign because they need to know how much money they have to operate. You know, what kind of moves they need to make to operate. Do they all of a sudden need to go out and sign a designated hitter that's not Shohei? So for everyone's sake, hopefully it's it's wrapped up soon. It kind of sounds like it's getting there, but I don't know about you, Josh. I'm kind of over it at this point. I'm kind of over every beat reporter saying these teams are reportedly still in. These teams are reportedly out. Uh, it's reportedly down to these teams. I think I saw some tweet earlier that was talking about someone was tracking like a private jet 
they went from like Toronto to Florida, then it was like to Anaheim and all this kind of stuff. I'm over all this. I want it to be, you know, over. If he doesn't go to the Dodgers, that sucks, but at least we don't have to see a million things a day uh, reporting something that we're just not going to know until the final the final announcement. Which is hilarious, though, because like it's now December 5th at the time of recording, right? No, there has there haven't really been any other moves either yet, but because Shohei's in the news every day, it's just like God. When is he just going to pick somewhere so that we can just stop right. this? But then it's like nobody else is signed either. I mean, the it's, Dodgers it, have a few already, which I think is like Dodgers have already got Max Muncie, and then the two that we're going to talk about today already. So it just seems like all of these low kind of deals are are being are being put in place. But still the big one, the guy that's in the news every day still hasn't decided. And I feel like once that happens, I'm not saying all the dominoes are going to start to fall, but I feel like then it's really going to ramp up. Because once Shohei signs, then everybody's going to know what they're working with, what they have left over. So we'll see what we get. Hopefully it's sooner rather than later. I would like to think it's going to be by the end of the week. Yeah, I think the only big moves in general was the Mariners trade the other day when they sent Kelnick to the yeah. Braves, and then I guess the Aaron Nola, Sonny Gray signings. But I mean, those are I guess decent signings, but it's nothing you know major. So hopefully we get Shohei news soon. Hopefully the next time we record, we're talking about you know the Shohei contract and him being a Dodger. And oh, oh by the way, the Dodgers have also traded for all these guys because now they can operate knowing what their team is going to look like. So Shohei. Uh, please sign soon. If you're out there listening, uh, we would greatly appreciate it. But we are going to take a break. Josh, when if, we come if back. If Shohei is listening to Inside the Ravine from Odyssey <laughs> Sports, I would say that that is an incredibly good sign for Dodger fans. It would be. Got to see if we can confirm that somehow. But when we come back, we're going to be talking about the moves the Dodgers have made and a piece of news that Dave Roberts shared yesterday that isn't related to Shohei but pretty big for 2024. So we'll get to that right after the break. All right, Josh, so unfortunately, Shohei has not signed yet, but the Dodgers have made a couple of additions. Nothing major, but uh, again, two moves that we need to talk about. The first was they are bringing back Jason Hayward on a one-year contract. I believe I saw that it's worth $8 million, maybe $9 million, but he's going to be coming back. And overall, I'm, I'm okay with the move. Jason Hayward had a career year last year, arguably one of the best seasons of his big league career, which, you know, spans over a decade. He was fantastic, provided a great bat, provided great defense in right field, and the Dodgers' outfield options were kind of thin at the moment, so bringing him back on a one-year deal, cheap enough, he's a great, great leader in the clubhouse. I personally have no issue with the move at all. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's great, and, 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 you know, on top of that, good for him. The Dodgers signed him to a minor league contract last year. Um, they paid him seven hundred and twenty thousand dollars, uh, and he played his way into a one-year nine million dollar deal, which is still a team-friendly deal. So, yeah, I, I mean, good for him, good for the Dodgers. Um, I, you know, for his sake and for the team's sake, I hope that he can at least replicate what he did a year ago. But again, he hit like two seventy, fifteen home runs, um, had a pretty impressive WAR, all things considered. Um, and he was 34. He was 33, 34. Um, so, you know, he's going into his 15th season now. Um, he's been pretty good across his career. Um, for the most part, obviously he had some really down years that kind of ruined a lot of things for him, but this last year, I mean, he, he picked himself up. He played his way into a $9 million contract as a 34 year old. So, I think that just says, you know, at length what he accomplished last year and how good he was for the team. And uh, I think it's a good, it's a good deal. It's a team friendly option. Like why, why would you not go out and do that? And this was something that we had talked about before. You know, we had some questions about who would be back, who wouldn't be. And he was one of those guys along with the next guy we're going to talk about, along with a guy like JD Martinez, who we thought was a steal, an absolute robbery for what they got him for last year. And, would love to have him back if there's a spot and if there's a team-friendly deal. To this day, like, Shohei is priority number one. I would love to see J.D. Martinez with the Dodgers. But again, it depends if it's a team-friendly deal. It depends on who else you get. Jason Hayward is the type of guy where it's like, if you get another outfielder, which I feel like, based off what we've seen, isn't going to be the top priority, I feel like. You know, we've talked about some of the other, you know, priorities for the Dodgers. Obviously, Shohei's number one. But if you're going out and getting 34-year-old Jason Hayward, after a phenomenal year, 
at for a one year nine million dollar deal. I think it's a steal. Hopefully it works out for him again. Yeah, I mean, I I loaded up his numbers from last year just because I wanted to take another glance, and I forgot just again how how good he truly was. His one seventeen OPS plus was the third best of his entire career. His fourteen year career, the third best. And Josh, his slugging percentage of four seventy three was the second highest of his career, barely just under what he did in 2012 when he was an MVP, I was going to say finalist, he wasn't a finalist, but he received MVP votes, hit 27 homers that year, and his slugging percentage was almost identical, so I got no issue with it. It's funny, it seems like it's so expensive because he only made, like you said, $750,000 last year. That's because the Cubs were paying him like $30 million to not be on their team, so I got no issue with it. My only thing is... I really hope he doesn't have to be their everyday right fielder. Like, if Jason Hayward plays 100 to 120 games, I'll be okay with that. He played 124 last year for the Dodgers. I do think he's going to take a, a slight step back next year. Again, as a bench piece, as a guy that starts a couple times a week, I like it. But I do hope the Dodgers have some more moves up their sleeve where they're not having to rely on 35-year-old Jason Hayward in right field. But again, you at least get a spot from a guy you know he's going to contribute, you know he's going to stay healthy. And again, he provides great defense in right field, which is a massive bonus as well. So overall, I do like it. But Josh, another move, another old friend that is returning, I guess technically this is uh, part three of the Joe Kelly experience. Joe Kelly, he comes back. Now this one, Josh, I think is very, very interesting because originally Joe Kelly, I think, had, I want to say a $9.5 million option that was declined and then the Dodgers gave him a $1 million buyout. Well, reportedly, his new contract is for one year for $8 million. So if you throw on the $1 million buyout to the $8 million, the Dodgers are essentially saving $500,000 by going through this entire process. Now, I do have my theory. Josh, you know I like to come up with my hypotheticals and all of my fun conspiracy theories. I think that the Dodgers and Joe Kelly, they each knew they wanted a reunion. They each wanted to come back in 2024. But by doing this, by not picking up his option, if they would have picked up his option, Joe Kelly would currently be on the 40-man roster. By doing so right now, he's a free agent. Both Joe Kelly and Jason Hayward are unofficially on the 40-man roster. They haven't been made official yet. So the Dodgers right now, Josh, their 40-man sits at 39. Obviously, if they want to sign Shohei and some other guys, they're going to have to trim that roster down. But right now, those guys are kind of sitting in limbo. They can just chill until they make it official. So I think that's why the Dodgers did this with Joe Kelly. They wanted to get a little creative. But overall, he's back. He's a fan favorite. And he was great for the Dodgers last year. So the price, a little more than I'd like to see for a reliever. But I think that's the price you got to pay to get a fan favorite and a guy that can contribute as your third, third or fourth best option. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it is interesting, and given that I, you're right, I think it's more for the 40 man roster spots than it is for saving five hundred thousand um, dollars. Ultimately, that more than anything makes me think that this was almost something that was, you know, for lack of a better term, agreed on before he was his option was declined because. Saving $500,000 is not that much for the Dodgers. At the same time, I think for Joe Kelly, who's taking ultimately $9 million in his pocket instead of $9.5 million, realistically, like, that's not a huge difference either. So that makes me think that this was agreed, on, agreed upon beforehand so that the Dodgers had a little bit more wiggle room to try to make some moves this offseason. Um, and then again, that's the huge thing with bringing back Jason Hayward as well in that same kind of way. Um, so that you have a little bit more wiggle room. But ultimately, Joe Kelly's been good for the Dodgers. Like you said, he's a fan favorite. Um, you know, he's pitched for the Dodgers in four of the last five, four of the last six postseasons. It's four of the last five. And then he also won a World Series with him. So, I mean, when he came over last year, again, we talked about this at the time, that is a team-friendly, low-risk, high-reward deal that the Dodgers completed to bring him back. It was the same thing with Kike Hernandez. It was the same thing with Ahmed Rosario. It was similar to the Lance Lynn situation as well. Like these were all guys that, you know, were, were, when are the Dodgers going to make a huge splash? And they didn't because they knew the pieces that they needed to make a run for the world series. Ultimately it didn't work out, but post trade trade deadline, I thought all of those options had worked out brilliantly. Even yeah. Lance Lynn until the, until, you know, the playoffs when he gave up all those home runs against the D backs. But ultimately like those were all 
low risk, high reward type guys, and it paid off. And for Joe Kelly, it played his way into another op into another year. So ultimately, his option was declined, but he's back essentially in his hometown. Um, and and again, I think it's another team friendly deal. I mean, it's 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 tough because he got hurt when he came over. I think he appeared in only eleven games, but in the eleven games we saw him, Josh, one point seventy four ERA, one point thirty two FIP, zero point eighty seven WHIP, two hundred and fifty eight ERA plus, and he had nineteen strikeouts in ten innings. Like Joe Kelly was fantastic in the brief time we saw him with the Dodgers last year. And when he came back for the postseason, he was just as good as well. So it's not like you're bringing in a guy that's just a fan favorite. You're bringing in a guy that showed last year he might be getting better. Like, he's still hitting 100. His strikeout rate is at an all-time high. And if you have everyone healthy in this bullpen next year, assuming you have Evan Phillips, Bruce Dark Ratterall, Blake Trinan, Joe Kelly, that four right there is probably the best group of four any bullpen is going to have across baseball. So I absolutely love it. He's probably going to get hurt again at some point next year. But there there are a number of these guys, Josh, where you want them on your team. Like a Jason Hayward because he's that veteran presence. Joe Kelly's the veteran presence. But he also has that edge that he brings where you want him on the mound like in big situations. So I, I personally love the move. I'm glad that they brought him back. At this point, bring back all the guys. Bring back Kike. I think I saw a report that Jock might be rumored coming back to the Dodgers. So uh, we'll see. But as of right now, Josh, yeah, that that's where things get interesting. Because I, like I mentioned, unofficially on the 40-man roster, there are 39 right now. So if they want to add them... Some guys are going to have to go, whether that's minor leaguers going in trades, whether that's guys getting DFA'd, I'm not quite certain, but you can't have them not officially added for like weeks. I think last year when JD Martinez signed, I want to say he was like unofficially on the 40 man for like a week or so. And I think Jason Hayward's approach in a week and Joe Kelly, I think happened over the weekend. So hopefully we get moves uh, at some point, but yeah, Josh, a month into the season and the only moves the Dodgers have made are bringing back guys that were on the team last year. Because we already talked about them bringing back Max Muncy in an episode or two ago, and that might have been it. I don't even... It's been so long, Josh. <laughs> Was that it? Are these the only three moves we've gotten so far? I think so. I guess, uh, what, that Ricky Venasco guy, who has not pitched above the minor league level. I think the Dodgers signed him, but nothing there. Uh, so who knows? Josh, you want to talk about the final bit of uh, fun news that we got yesterday? Oh, absolutely. This is uh, this is an interesting one. So uh, Dave Roberts, once again, the man who's, uh, I guess, saying it all, was on MLB Network, and he was asked about Mookie Betts and uh, where Mookie is probably going to be playing next year. And Dave Roberts flat out said, Mookie Betts is our everyday second baseman. And everyone was like, wait a second, what? We knew that he was probably going to be playing a lot of second base next year again. But now it looks like, Josh, the Dodgers are fully committing to Mookie being their everyday second baseman. And then I guess when Dave Roberts spoke to reporters, he doubled down and said, yeah, he's probably going to get a start in right field every now and then, get Jason Hayward off his feet. But Mookie Betts is our everyday second baseman. And for me personally, I think this completely changes what the Dodgers need to do this offseason. Because now you have Mookie Betts as your second baseman. It sounds like they're committing to Gavin Lux as their shortstop. We already have Freddie at first, Max Muncy at third. So the infield is pretty much set. You have Miguel Rojas as a bench option. But now, all of a sudden, Miguel Vargas, Michael Bush, those guys have absolutely no room unless they just want to treat them as bench pieces or teach them how to play left field. But I don't think that's ideal. And now, all of a sudden, you have question marks in your outfield. Is Jason Hayward going to be your everyday right fielder? Like I mentioned earlier, I certainly hope not. And then you look at left field, and your only option really at the moment is Chris Taylor. So I don't know if the Dodgers want to commit to Chris Taylor and Jason Hayward as their everyday you know, corner outfielders, but I don't know what this means for them. I don't know what this means for Vargas and Bush. I, I think it makes the Dodgers offseason plans needing to add a, a superstar outfielder that much more important. Yeah, you know, we we talked about some of these offseason moves that we wanted the Dodgers to do, and, and you and I threw out a couple of third basemen as well. You know, go out and get a legit third baseman, move Max Muncy over to second base, and yeah. now you've got a couple of really big bats in your lineup. You know, we, we threw Matt Chapman's name out there. I know that you had thrown Nolan Arenado out there. And, and now I don't want to say that completely eliminates the possibility of some of those guys, but 
in my opinion, it, it might be close because if Mookie Betts is going to be your everyday second baseman, and it certainly shifts Vargas around, it certainly shifts um, it, Michael Bush around. And then in your outfield, it makes a lot more sense if the Dodgers do want to put Mookie at second base, the Jason Hayward sign. You know, it makes a lot more sense. Yeah. But again, you know, I don't think Jason Hayward can be your everyday right fielder. So again, I think that maybe the Dodgers have kind of thought, hey, we can get by in the infield with this and and then move Mookie to second base. Let's go get another big bat and a good arm and a good defensive player for the outfield. Because obviously, you know, you've got your center fielder in James Altman. You've got your what what we'll call right now, you've got your right fielder in Jason Hayward. And now you've got Mookie at second base. So left field is still pretty open. And sure, Chris Taylor can be out there. But the thing about Chris Taylor, which is obviously the, the, the beautiful thing about Chris Taylor, is dude can play anywhere. So yeah. is he going to, in fact, be your everyday left fielder? Or are you going to kind of platoon him everywhere? Because Jason Hayward can do the same thing, right? He played all three outfield positions last year. He played one game at first. He played a game at first. Yeah. A it was probably games, a blowout. Maybe, <laughs> Maybe more than one, but he did he did appear at first base. But again, yeah. that's a guy that you can put in all three outfield positions. You can put Chris Taylor anywhere. So is your outfield solidified with from left to right, Taylor, Outman, Hayward? Is that going to be your everyday outfield? Because I don't think that's good enough for a team that wants to yeah. win a World Series here. Um, and I know that obviously the Dodgers are hoping that they have Shohei in the lineup as well as their DH, but we don't know anything. So by saying that Mookie Betts is likely going to be your everyday second baseman, that makes me think that maybe they are shifting their focus to the outfield in this offseason. Do you think Michael Bush is just sitting at home reading that notification and going, are you kidding me, man? What, what, what did I do? What have I done? Like, I know, again, I, I think I read somewhere that, again, they, they could probably try and teach Miguel Vargas and Michael Bush how to play left field, but who knows how well that's going to go. If anything... This just kind of makes it seem like a guarantee that both Vargas and Bush just ship them off in a trade package together to maybe acquire an outfielder or acquire a starting pitcher because at this point, it would be stupid to keep Vargas and Bush as bench bats. It seems like either have them as starters or ship them off while their value is still high because you can find cheaper bench options that are going to give you more production elsewhere. So if I'm the Dodgers, you're committed to Mookie at second base now for the long term. I'd be calling the Rays and say, hey, Randy or Rosarena, we'll start with Michael Bush, we'll start with Miguel Vargas, we'll start with Emmett Sheehan, what else do you want? Throw in Tyler Glass now as well. Or you call the White Sox and you say, Luis Robert, Dylan Sees, we'll start with Michael Bush, we'll start with Miguel Vargas, we'll throw in a couple pitchers, let's make that happen because, yeah, Josh, like you said as well, Chris Taylor, Jason Hayward, those are fine pieces. Like those are those are solid options. But if they're your everyday corner outfielders for a 162 game season, that's not going to be that ideal. And I do think the Dodgers need to add a superstar outfielder like one of those guys. I still am all in, all in on just trading for Juan Soto, put him in left field, and then uh, we know <laughs> make the lineup deeper. But yeah, I, I just I, I think the Dodgers need to make a trade for an outfielder because the current outfielders on the free agent market aren't great at all. I, I looked at them before we did the show. And it's not great. Like, Jorge Soler is probably the best option. He hits a lot of home runs, but his defense is awful, and I don't want him for more than a year. So I think the Dodgers might get creative. Who knows? But like I said, I, I, I don't want Chris Taylor and Jason Hayward each getting 140, 150 starts in the outfield this year. The one thing I will say, and I know this was a little while ago, but Michael Bush um, obviously has mostly played as a second baseman in his pro career. Um. But that all stemmed from his one summer in the Cape League. I mean, he was... Uh, Where was he, he was, in the Cape know, League, Josh? Base. I don't remember. Um, hmm. He was... Uh, yeah. Hmm. He lived the summer catch <laughs> experience. Um, yeah. He, you know, he, was, he was at first base. He played in the outfield. Um, but it was when he went to the Cape League, his one summer in, in the Cape League, in front of all the scouts, was when he got transitioned to second base. And when he went back to North Carolina that next year, he did play other places, but again, when the Dodgers drafted him, they drafted him and announced him as a second baseman, which I think caught a lot of people off guard, but a lot of people didn't realize like, Hey, when he played in front of all these big league scouts in the best, you know, wood bat league in the country, like with all the other top prospects he played second base. So I think that's kind of that moment that he appeared as a second baseman. I know that he can play other places, 
again, I think he probably projects better as a second baseman, which is why I think we have viewed him as a viable option at second base, even last year when he came in and played second base. But who knows? Maybe there is that opportunity to put him in the outfield. And maybe the same can be said for Miguel Vargas, obviously. But I think for, for Michael Bush, maybe defensively he's a little bit more versatile. But again, I do think that this kind of change, if Mookie is expected to be the everyday second baseman, I certainly do think that changes the Dodgers' plans a little bit. Yeah, and again, you you could keep them as bench pieces, and that would give the Dodgers a really strong bench because as of right now, it looks like you pretty much have your hitters all locked up with the exception of your designated hitter because you have your infield that I mentioned, you have the outfield I mentioned, and then your bench right now looks like Austin Barnes, Miguel Rojas, Miguel Vargas, and I guess Michael Bush. So worst case scenario, that's not awful to have as depth pieces and guys you can you know swap in here and there. But for those two guys especially, I mean, again, their trade value is probably right now the highest it's ever going to be. If they keep them, it's just going to continue to diminish. So if you want to strike while the iron's hot and get them away and bring something in while you can, I I think it would be smart for the Dodgers. But it's going to be interesting, Josh, because there are still so many things the Dodgers need. They need starting pitching. They need a designated hitter. They need probably another bat at some position, most likely outfield. So... We'll have to wait and see. This team is currently, uh, you know, in in progress. And hopefully, the do- I mean, I, obviously, Andrew Friedman, Brandon Gomes, they're smart. They know what the team needs. But it just seems like there are just so many question marks that are still so pressing. But again, I think it's because Shohei hasn't signed yet. That's why we haven't seen any action. But I, I would like to see the Dodgers address these, you know, issues at some point. Because, like I said, I Jason Hayward, 140 starts. Please no. Chris Taylor, he was fine last year, but I don't want him starting every game. Yeah, I mean, let's see what we get, right? I mean, and I feel like we also say this every year, like a little over a year ago, we would have been saying like, Chris Taylor's your everyday left fielder, you know? Like we, we've had a couple of guys like that where, you yeah. know, Max Muncy was like, a, Max Muncy's a top five bat in the game, right? And I think actually the numbers for Max Muncy do, you know, hold up. But again, like the batting average, not very good. But the home runs and the RBIs and the slugging percentage, all super high. I mean, we talked about that before too. Like, as an like, they were all stars just a few years ago. Muncie and Taylor, and Muncie, I feel like we view differently now. But Taylor was an all star right. a few years ago. Was the reliable bat for the Dodgers, and now it's kind of turned because of these last few seasons. Who knows? Maybe that changes this year. But at least for right now, I think the Dodgers do have a little bit more work to do. Yeah, so hopefully, again, Shohei signs soon and then they can get to work. One final thing, Josh, I don't know if you saw this on uh, Twitter yesterday, but I guess Tom Verducci was on MLB Network. They were doing a segment, and I guess they asked him, so Tom, if you're the Dodgers, what are you doing? I think they pretty much did what we did last episode. They said, if you're Andrew Friedman, what are you doing? And this was literally me. (laughs) He pretty much came out and said, okay, first off, I'm signing Shohei Otani. Next thing I'm doing is I'm trading for Corbin Burns. And then the next thing I'm doing is I'm trading for Randy or Rosarena. I'm just sitting there going, man, me and Tom Verducci, we're on the same page here. We have this master plan oh, of all these signings, all these trades we're going to be doing. Hey, it's not not as bad as my uh, seven seven part plan that I laid out in the last episode. I think yeah, trading for something. Soto was like number five on the list. So, hey, someone else is someone else is thinking it out there. So a lot of moves the Dodgers can do. You're not alone. Uh, I'm not alone. Uh, Josh, any uh, final final words before we head out for this episode? End of the week. That's my prediction. End of the week. Who do you think is going to break it first? Uh, I'm going to say... I'm going to go Ken Rosenthal. I'll go Ken Rosenthal. Um, and then... Oh, what if I said... What if I said Blake Harris? See, I need to time it just right where I'm like, okay, I'm feeling Friday. And then I just time it like seven minutes before Passon drops it. And then I, cl- I How are you going to do that? Well, you just go... got to get lucky. No, you're right. I think it's going to be Passon. I think it's going to be Passon. That's what I'll go with. I'm, I'm already expecting the tweets. Passon's going to be in the all caps breaking. Shohei Otani and the Los Angeles Dodgers have agreed to a historic contract. LA gets their guy. You're then going to get Rosenthal saying, sources, Shohei Otani and Dodgers agree to deal. Then you're going to get Heyman that comes out and just says, Otani to Dodgers. Yeah, and that's then Bob, a good one. And then Bob Nightingale is going to say, Shohei Otani 
and the Angels have agreed to uh, a deal. <laughs> so, All right, and then, th- and then I'm sure you'll get a Dodgers guy, like uh, like friend of the show, Jack Harris, will be like, can confirm. Yes. There you go. Can confirm. So those, those are how the tweets are going to go. Hopefully it's Friday. Hopefully they're saying Dodgers, but if not... Maybe we'll get some moves going. So uh, thank you guys so much for listening. Again, make sure to listen to the episode wherever you guys get your podcast, Spotify, Apple, and of course the Odyssey app. You guys can also find us on social media at Inside the Ravine, on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and of course YouTube. For Josh Schaefer, this has been Blake Harris. Rock on our beautiful, ugly Christmas sweater t-shirts. And we hope you guys enjoy the rest of your week wherever you may be.